Howdy folks, welcome back to Teton Todd's Mountain Adventures. We're back here again at the Museum of the Mountain Man in Pinedale, Wyoming. And this morning I thought we'd do a quick video on bed rolls and buffalo robes. Uh, one of the details that people often ask about is when you're out camping, primitive style, how do you sleep or what do you use? Obviously we don't use, you know, a north face, downfield sleeping bag. We try to recreate the life that the mountaineers used and the things they used. So this morning we're going to get into some details about how they slept and how they stayed comfortable in the outdoors. And the first thing we're going to talk about is blankets. Probably the base thing you need to know about is the mountaineers, when they came out west, they brought blankets with them. These blankets were manufactured in, in woolen mills in England and later in factories in the United States. And if you look in the journals and the records of the things they bought and imported, they brought a lot of wool blankets to the United States and thus out to St. Louis and they were brought out to the mountains. And probably the most primary color, the most common blanket was a white with either a black or a blue stripe made by Whitney or Hudson Bay. You're all familiar with the, with the, the bars on them that talk that, you know, some people say that these uh, marks meant the, the, how many beaver that the blankets were traded for. It's actually the size of the blanket. And later they started marking them with their, their symbol. This is a Hudson Bay blanket. Now in the Mountaineer times, they didn't have these tags on them. Um, so you need to decide whether you want to leave them on or not. The reason I've left this one on is because it's an antique blanket, probably made in the 1920s or 1930s. So I've left it on. The blankets normally came in pairs, which are double long blankets, and then they tore them in half, or they tore them to a single blanket length. So because of that, the blankets were not, the, the edges weren't whipped with a blanket stitch. So if you want to be really authentic in your portrayal and your blankets, you're going to want to remove that whip stitch from the edge of the blanket. And you're going to say, well, well gosh, Teton, won't that make my blanket, you know, unravel a little bit or completely? Well, they may unravel a little, but it, it won't, uh, won't be too bad. You can see on this blanket here, I've removed the, the whipping from it, and it's, it's unraveled a little bit, but not completely. That's just one of those little details. If you want to be super authentic in your presentation, you want to look at is, is getting rid of that blanket stitching. So, uh, the blankets came in a variety of colors, like I say. One of the most popular ones you'll see is that, that Hudson Bay candy stripe with the, the various different colors of stripes on the end. Those are authentic to the time period. We know that because you see in the trade records when they ordered blankets, they ordered white blankets, red blankets, green blankets by the dozens, by the tens of dozens. And, a, and included in there are those multicolor striped blankets. So a few years back, some people thought that those candy stripe blankets weren't authentic to the period, but they are, okay? So there's all, kind of, there's all kinds of these English manufactured blankets. Another blanket I want to talk to you about today is a Navajo blanket. These blankets are, of course, woven by the Navajo back into the 1600s. You know, as they, the Spanish came in and introduced the sheep to the Southwest, they quickly learned how to imitate the blankets that the Spanish brought. And so uh, the, the Navajos were weaving blankets quite early. This is an early chief style blanket, and you want to stay with the earliest style because after the 1840s they changed and started getting into the second and third phase chief's blankets, which are much more fancy. This one's a, a first phase chief's blanket. Beautiful blanket. You'll see blankets like these in a couple of Carl Bodmer paintings that were traded clear up onto the northern plains. Okay. This is a very heavy, very durable, 100% wool, hand-woven blanket. And a friend of mine and myself figured out a place to get these out of old Mexico, so we're having these recreated. So if you're really interested in getting a blanket like this, you can contact me through my uh, email address, and we can hook you up with a beautiful blanket like this. They're extremely warm. They haven't been folded and, and, and napped up like these blankets have, so they're, they're very dense very heavy, very, very warm, and by the way, also very beautiful as you can see. I really like these first phase Chiefs blankets. Uh, very correct for a mountaineer portrayal. If you uh, were down in Santa Fe or Taos or passed through there at any time, you could have picked up a blanket like this. So you got, again, manufactured blankets out of the factories. You got these hand-woven blankets by the Indians. The other thing that the, all the mountaineers used in the Indians was a nice well tanned buffalo robe. 
So here's a nice large robe, well tanned. And I'll show you one way, or a couple methods here of making a, a bed roll out of these. You just take a buffalo robe like this, you could toss it out. And then take your blanket, and just lay in there. Now on my robe, I've tied some ties down the side here, so I can put that blanket in and flip this over the top, and then tie this shut so well, I'm, if I thrash around it all during the evening or something, it's not going to come undone. That's a simple bed right there. If I needed more, I feel like it's going to be a really cold night, I'd act maybe put a couple of blankets in there. Now, usually I'll fold my blankets at the foot over so I don't kick my feet out at night. And you could spend a fairly comfortable night in a, a robe like that. The robe acts as a mattress underneath, blanket above. Of course, you got multi blankets inside for the warmth. This would be a pretty good bedroll if the weather wasn't going to be bad. If you didn't expect, you know, wind and, or snow, or a lot of rain. Now, if rain is going to be a problem, then you're going to need some kind of a ground cloth. And underneath all this, you can see that I've got a large piece of oil cloth. And you say, well, what would the mountaineers use? They'd use this, sometimes it was called Russia sheeting in the old records, or just canvas or sailcloth. And this has been treated with some oil to make it a little more water resistant. And they'd use these to pack their, on their pack mules as mantis pack their loads. So you could use that same cloth, that same canvas cloth that you're packing on the mules as a ground cloth for your bedroll. Nowadays, I we use these you can see this bedroll over here has got it on the outside, tied up nice. You can pack that up on your horse or toss that in your canoe. Again, the, the, bed, the size of the bedroll is going to vary depending on the weather. If it's nice, soft summer doings like now, you might need only one blanket. Maybe two. You could throw one on the ground as a, as a mattress and use one above you. But the other benefit of uh, an oil cloth is it really cuts the wind real well and holds the heat in. We've noticed a great difference if you just go out and sleep with just your blankets without an oil cloth. You're not quite as comfortable, especially when the wind starts blowing. So, and, and of course the oil cloth helps keep your blankets from getting too dirty. So here I'm going to show you how I commonly fold and set up my blankets in a bedroll. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do that. Uh, get my oil cloth stretched out here. You can see this one's a single piece. It's about 16 feet long. So I just put my bedroll on the top and fold, fold it over. Now if you got a couple pieces, if you don't, if you can't find a piece that long, you can just certainly sew a couple eight foot pieces together. You have to decide how long you want it based on your height and stuff. I'm a little bit taller than the average person, so mine's about eight, eight and a half feet long for the, so double that for the, the length of this canvas, okay? So what, how, how I usually start out my bedroll is if, it's going to be a little bit cold, and I think I'm going to need some more insulation. I'll put uh, this blanket on the bottom. Fold it uh, the longer way here. And this is going to be my ground insulation right there. Act kind of as a pad also. Now there's one little tip about your bedroll, or about sleeping. If you're sleeping on the hard ground, see this is pretty nice soft grass here that they provided for us. If you're sleeping out on the hard ground, for me especially, the, the, the part that hurts the most is my hip. Laying on the hard ground with my hip. So they, uh, there's a thing we call a hip hole. You dig a little depression. And it's just a little gradual dip. So when you're laying on that on your hip at night, that's not getting all the pressure. You're not you know, balancing all your weight on just your hip bone. But it's spread out along your leg, up on your side. So you need to kind of make a little depression in the dirt there underneath your bedroll, where you think your hip, hip's going to be. And you're going to lay down and try that out a couple times. Make it a very gradual dip, not with sharp edges on it, or you'll feel that all night long. OK, so we got that pad laid out. Then I lay out one blanket lengthwise. What I'm going to do here is kind of create sort of a sleeping bag sort of a function where I'm going to make a sort of an envelope. Let me 
grabbing any blanket here. So let me do it that way. I'm going to lay it out and hold this side back. And lay this blanket in with the fold on the other side, like this. And I'm not going to be too neat about this because we're I want you to get bored. So I got the, the green blankets folds on this side, the white blankets fold on that side. Now I'm going to throw this side back and fold the green blanket back in on that one. And the white blanket back over the top of that. So now what I've created is a, a tube with folds on both sides so I can't kick out of either side. Okay, now some people are thrashers when they sleep and, they, and they, they'll kick the blankets loose and stuff. So if you do that, you're going to want to get a couple of blanket pins and maybe pin it right here between both of these layers and down at the feet and on, again over on that side. So when you roll around at night, the blankets don't come apart and get all disheveled and mess, messed up. Okay? So I've created sort of a mummy bag out of blankets. And again down here, I'm going to want to fold this over to the length of my bed roll, that way my feet won't kick out the bottom. Okay? Now if that folded like that, I can toss my oil cloth back over the top. Now you'll notice on this, this oil cloth also, I've put some ties on it, okay? But those, those ties are made so the bed roll can fold, the, the top of my canvas can fold over and under and tie so if I'm laying out in a rainstorm with just this canvas tied and I fold it under, the water is going to hit it and roll off of both sides and won't get into my bedroll. Okay? But for folding it up now, it's just a simple matter of whipping those sides in and roll it up. Okay? And then I use a couple of belts, a couple of leather belts to tie my bedroll together. You can see this one over here, he's got several long leather ties. These are useful for tying stuff together around camp when you're in camp. You can hang up a line and hang your clothes on it. You can use those leather wangs to make a tripod. Um, I personally kind of favor these belts because they're a replacement for, for broken horse gear. If I needed to take one of these off and use it for horse gear, of course I'd replace it on my bedroll with a piece of hemp rope or something. Uh, also, you know, if you, if you need an extra belt, you've got it here. If, you're, if your own belt breaks. So now it's just a matter of rolling this up nice and tight. Now if I'm going on a canoe trip, this is very waterproof bedroll. You gotta be careful when you get here at the end. You're gonna wanna fold this into a nice point. Get this end tucked back up into there so you don't have any loose ends hanging out. And then I, I've thrown that in the bottom of the canoe of course, I don't let it float in the bottom. Of the, you know, if there's a lot of water, I try to put a couple of pieces of wood across the bottom of the canoe to keep this right up off the very bottom. But uh, I've had that in canoe all day. It keeps it pretty, uh, it's pretty waterproof, pretty resistant. This oil cloth has developed a nice sheen and patina to it from the dirt and wear and stuff, so it's quite waterproof. So that makes a a fairly light, compact bedroll with just two blankets in it. Actually, there's three in there. Um, sometimes if I know I'm going out into real seriously cold weather, I'll put even an extra blanket in there. Okay, and That bedroll is something that's heavy enough that you're not going to want to carry that around too much. But uh, one thing I didn't bring is I have a, a strap that I could I put rope through the middle of the bedroll as I'm rolling it up, and then it's got a leather strap here I can carry that on if I'm going to carry this for any length of time on the trail. If we're going on a trek or something and I don't have a horse handy. But uh, in that case, there's a trade off between weight on the trail and comfort at night. And only you can make that decision what you'd rather have. Um, I've struggled up the trail with a heavy bed roll like this, um, it wears on the shoulders and the neck. You suffer all day long, but boy, when you get to camp at night and it's cold, you're comfortable. Or you can be light on the trail and really relaxed and 
and enjoy the hike in, and then you get to camp that night and you've only got one blanket and it's a little, little colder. Of course, there's a whole bunch of other little tricks you can do to keep yourself warm at night. Uh, we're all programmed or accustomed to laying out flat and thinking that you know you need to spend the whole night out flat getting a good night's sleep. Well, sometimes the reality of the trail is that you're gonna sleep leaning up against a tree with a small fire at your feet, okay? If that's what it takes to survive that night, if it's that cold, then that's what you gotta do. You just don't expect to sleep like you would in a king-size bed with a big down comforter or something. So, as another famous historical interpreter once said, it's just another certain kind of misery, different level of comfort. So, once you get out on the trail and you do it a lot, uh, you get more accustomed to sleeping and, and I think maybe sleeping under, uh, under adverse or austere conditions, a lot of it has to do with uh, how tired you are from what you've done that day. Um, usually uh, when I'm out on the trail the first night I don't sleep quite as well as I, as I hope, but the second, third, fourth, and subsequent nights I get a lot better night's sleep because I'm starting to get used to it. And you know, there's actually a sleeping under a nice comfortable buffalo robe with some wool blankets is very comfortable. Uh, something I sometimes think about when I'm at home and I'm looking forward to the next trip when I can get back in my buffalo robe and get a good night's sleep. So that's just a little simple video show you how one, one method of, of making a bedroll, uh, folding your blankets like that. Some people don't like to, to get that cocooned inside the blankets. They like to keep the folds on one side so they can throw it off quickly and jump out. Um, I'm not much of a thrasher when I sleep. I'm able to kind of make little quick movements and roll over easily without kicking all my blankets apart. Um, one, one consideration is if you've got horses out there um, and if you have to jump up quickly in the nighttime and, and go take care of the horses, they like to be able to throw their bed open and jump out. Um, again, I can scoot out of the end of my, my bedroll fairly quickly and jump up. Um, sometimes, uh, especially if you have horses around, I'll usually sleep in my clothes without taking my leggings or my moccasins off, as long as they're dry. Uh, I'll keep an extra pair of moccasins around if it's going to be wet weather, then I'll put the dry ones on at night and sleep in those. Then if I had to jump up at night, I've already got them on and, and I'm clothed and I can run out and, and take care of business. If I don't have horses with me, that's not quite as big a concern. Uh, the only concern there would be maybe answering nature's call in the middle of the night and, you know, you want to walk out barefoot or can you walk out and you have your moccasins on. So other little considerations like that, other little details, we won't get too much into that. Um, what, do you, what do you use for a pillow? Well, you just fold up whatever you got and stuff it up under your head. You know, if you've got a, a saddle, you can lean up against that, put a little padding against it. Um, sometimes uh, you might bring a, an extra piece of buffalo and you can fold that up and put it underneath you. Um, use your coat, those sort of things. Again, that takes some getting used to because we don't do that daily in our lives. And, it takes a little time to transition from your comfortable bed at home with your soft uh, pillow to out on the trail. But it doesn't take too long to get used to those sort of things and you get a good night's sleep out on the trail. So that's uh, bed rolls and buffalo robes. Um, thanks for visiting again. We'll hope to see you again down the trail. Take care.